Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. I hope you had a relaxing and enjoyable break over the Christmas period. I've had about four days of non-stop family gatherings, but they've been great and it's been nice to have a break from making videos. That said though, I did sneak away each night quite late and did a bit of benchmarking. I really wanted to check out the PUBG 1.0 release. The game has finally left the early access status and is now a fully released game that happened on December 20th. And I did promise you guys once the game was officially released that I would do a big CPU benchmark and that'll probably be followed by a GPU benchmark in the not too distant future. After revisiting PUBG performance earlier this month, I didn't benchmark on the test server. Rather, I looked at the performance most gamers were being faced with at the time. It was a pretty grim situation with the game maxed out at 1080p, the mighty GTX 1080 Ti with the support of the Core i7-8700K was barely able to push 100fps and often dropped down into the 90s. For a game that looks pretty average, let's say, in terms of visuals, uh, that was a pretty weak result. Anyway, the test server build was showing better performance, so I was keen to retest the game once it was officially released. The plan was to test the same section of the game for a direct comparison, and while I do want to do this, this isn't the point of this particular video. Rather, I've been really keen to check out the frame rate performance using the new desert map. That and I couldn't actually get a game that would load into the original map, so that was a bit frustrating. Right now, you can't actually select which map you want to play on. Apparently, the map selection is just completely random. Well, anyway, I tried about 20 games across multiple servers, and every time I ended up on the desert map. So, in a way, this is kind of where I've been forced to test for now. Anyway, something very cool about the release version is the replay feature. The game now automatically records every match so you can play it back. This is particularly useful for benchmarking as it's now possible to test the exact same pass over and over again. I also found a little trick that makes it possible to jump right into the action rather than having to watch the entire replay from the start. Simply parachute into the hot zone and when you land hit Alt F4 and this will abruptly close the game. Then you have to quickly reopen the game and when you hit start it will give you the option to rejoin the match where you left so that's pretty cool. The game then loads you into the exact spot you dropped from and you can continue from there. I played for about two minutes then exited to the lobby and this created a two minute pass for me to benchmark over and over again. No longer do I have to suffer through countless passes where I end up getting killed. The only remaining issue now is that the game still has a 144 FPS cap and the previous method of removing it no longer works. I wasn't able to find a workaround in time for this video, but if you know of a way to disable the frame cap, then please feel free to share it below in the comment section. Now, last on my benchmark CPU performance in PUBG, the AMD Ryzen CPUs got completely annihilated by the Intel competition, especially the quad-core Ryzen parts. Nerd Techgasm, who is a very knowledgeable code monkey, explained that this is due to the fact that PUBG is built using the Unreal Engine 4, which is only optimized for Intel architectures, and we have seen a bit of this in the past, though PUBG is certainly one of the more extreme examples we've seen. For now, the focus is likely on fixing the plethora of bugs rather than optimizing CPU instructions. Anyway, if you guys haven't checked out Nerd Techgasm's channel, I strongly suggest you do. He has a lot of very interesting and educational videos relating to CPU and GPU tech. I'll include a link in the video description. Now for testing, I've walked through the town of Los Leones for 60 seconds, and this is more than enough time to gather the data we need. Once again, I've taken 16 different AMD and Intel CPUs, benchmarked them at 1080p using the very low, medium, and ultra quality presets with a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti using the latest 388.71 display driver. All unlocked Intel CPUs, along with the Ryzen CPUs, have been tested using DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Meanwhile, the locked Intel CPUs were tested using DDR4 2400CL14 memory. So, for example, the Core i3-8350K was tested with 3200 memory, but the Core i3-8100 used 2400 memory. I've also noted the CPU utilization of all 16 CPUs tested for those of you interested, and that can be seen towards the end of the video. So let's jump into the benchmark results. First up, we have the very low quality preset results, and here the 7th and 8th gen Intel Core series of processors look to be mostly limited by the game's 144 FPS frame cap. The quad-core Ryzen CPUs really look to be struggling with the 1% low results, though there is a huge margin between the minimum and average FPS results for pretty much all the CPUs tested, and I'll talk a bit more about this soon. Increasing the quality settings seems to impact the Intel CPUs more than the AMD CPUs, though of course many of the Intel CPUs are still being limited by the frame cap. 
Still here, the Ryzen 7 1800X is able to just pull ahead of the Core i3 8100. Uh, what a sad statement that is. Unfortunately for AMD, Ryzen gets hit with a double whammy in PUBG. Not only is the game more optimized for Intel hardware, but it also doesn't utilize more than four cores very well, as evident when comparing the 7600K and 7700K using the GTX 1080 Ti at 1080p. Moving on, we have the ultra quality preset results, and now we see something rather interesting. Although the more powerful Intel CPUs, such as the 8700K, 8600K, and 8400, for example, are all still hitting the frame cap, the 1% low results are shockingly low. In fact, when it comes to the smoothness factor, the AMD and Intel CPUs deliver a very similar experience. I found that while both were relatively smooth for the most part, every 20 to 30 seconds or so, there'd be a noticeable stutter, and this was true for all the hardware configurations tested. This is obviously an issue with the game. I noticed that this often happened when looking around quickly or entering a building for the first time. So while Intel completely stomps most of the rise and range for the average frame rate, the overall experience was very much the same. Looking at how the various quality presets impact CPU performance, we find quite a large variation in the 1% low results for the 8th gen core processors such as the 8700K and 8100. Interestingly, the very low preset provided a much smoother experience as opposed to the Ultra for the 8th gen Intel core processors. The dual core Pentium G4560 created such an extreme CPU bottleneck that changing the quality settings didn't really have that much of an impact on performance. The 1% low results for the Ryzen CPUs wasn't impacted significantly either. For the most part, the difference between the low and medium quality settings was almost non-existent. When it came to CPU utilization, I found a similar story to the previous test. Here, the Ryzen CPUs are woefully underutilized. In particular, Ryzen CPUs with SMT support are very poorly utilized. And again, this comes back to the game engine being optimized for Intel CPUs and therefore hyper-threading technology. So while some might look at the results and claim that Ryzen CPUs are useless for gaming, the real issue here being that the game is useless at utilizing Ryzen CPUs. By the way, these are the maximum utilization figures seen throughout the 60 second benchmark pass. Before wrapping things up, here is a quick side by side comparison between a few of the CPUs tested. Here you can monitor things like the CPU usage as well as the frame rate. Note here that the minimum frame rate is of course the minimum frames per second and not a frame time reading where we look within the second. I'll let this footage play for about a minute and then we'll wrap things up. So, as we found last time, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds really does play best with Intel hardware, at least for those seeking big frame rates with high-end GPUs. Truth be told though, the experience on something like a 6 or 8 core Ryzen CPU really is just as good, though it was pretty shoddy on the quad-core Ryzen CPUs, even those with SMT enabled, such as the 1500X and 1400, which is quite surprising. In fact, in a way, that proves that the game really has no idea what to do with those SMT threads. Uh, for example, the difference between the 1500X, which is a 4-core 8-thread CPU, and the 1300X, which is a 4-core four 4-thread, four it's really hard to spot the difference between those two, and unfortunately, the 1500X, like the 1300X, was quite stuttery at times. So very disappointing results there, and that was true even with the lowest possible quality settings. The best budget configuration would consist of an Intel quad core, a Core i5-6400 or something like that would work really well, and probably deliver a similar experience to the Ryzen 7 1800X. Once you compare the Core i3-8100 with an affordable motherboard, that would probably be the ultimate budget PUBG configuration. There's really no noticeable difference going from an Intel 4-core to a 6-core CPU in this title. Apart from the CPU, you'll also want 16GB of RAM for the best results, and of course you will want the fastest GPU you can afford. I'll also benchmark a stack of GPUs soon, somewhere in the vicinity of 30-40 to 40 new and old graphics cards. That'll most likely happen midway through next month. Unfortunately, through my testing, I found that the game does appear to be quite stuttery at times, even with high-end hardware. So. 
although we're out of the early access period now, there's still loads of work to be done, but I doubt that'll surprise anyone who's been following the game's development. Uh, if you monitor the frame rate in-game, the minimum FPS is actually quite respectable, but you might still notice uh, the odd stuttering or frame hitches here and there, especially when you zip around or look quite quickly, you'll sort of get a bit of a, a jerk or a stutter, and the minimum FPS or the frames per second doesn't necessarily catch that, but you'll definitely see it in the frame time results. And looking at those frame time results, which are those 1% low figures, uh, certainly reveals the stuttering that I noticed every now and then. Things have certainly improved from the last benchmark session, at least when looking at the average frame rates, they've all been boosted quite a bit. The stuttering that I saw every now and then, every 30 seconds or so, that was a little bit concerning. Hopefully that gets ironed out. I'm not sure what was going on there. I don't recall seeing that as often in the previous version that I tested, even though the averages were lower. Uh, it could be down to the map, because obviously I'm testing the desert map this time, not the original map, so there may be a bit of difference there in the optimization. But either way, I hope that we can see quite a few improvements come in the next few months for the performance. Anyway, that's going to do it for this one. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.